All right, in this last section, we're going to talk about acids and bases. So your book doesn't go into a huge amount of detail on this, and you'll learn a lot more when you get to chemistry. But to simplify things for you, in water, you have H2O, right? Um, but you also have, in very, very tiny amounts, it turns out that water molecules themselves can sort of break up into H+, plus and OH minus, hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Because water, technically, if we really want to think about it, water is HOH, right? We write it as H2O, but that's really what water is. So we're saying that water can break into these ions. Now, when I say a tiny amount, I mean in a really large amount of water, the amount of hydrogen and hydroxide ions, each of these, is about 10 to the negative 7th per every 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd water molecules. So in this huge amount of water molecules, we're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Here's my point, though. Um, it turns out that if you add certain things to water called acids, acids will increase the amount of hydrogen ions in water. So it won't be balanced anymore. These two, the H and the OH, won't be equal. There'll be more H than OH. And anything that increases this hydrogen concentration in water is called an acid. Anything that decreases the hydrogen concentration in water, or increases technically the OH concentration, is called a base. And that's really all that acids and bases are. Is they're things that change how many hydrogen ions and, and hydroxide ions there are in water. Now, we use a scale to simplify this because obviously these are really tiny numbers, right? 10 to the negative 7. Um, so instead, we've created something called a pH scale. Now, the pH scale, we're not going to learn how to calculate pH, but you actually, there's a formula for it. It's... Um, Oops, sorry, it's the negative log of the concentration of hydrogens. So in math, you probably haven't learned about logs yet, but the bottom line is they take the hydrogen concentrations and they plug it into a calculator using a log, something called a log function. And basically what it does is it gives us a scale from 0 to 14, with 7 being right in the middle. And so 7 is considered neutral. 7 is where the amount of hydrogen ions in the solution is technically 10 to the negative 7. As the hydrogen concentration goes up, the pH actually drops, and you get a stronger and stronger and stronger acid. So a pH of 6 would be a weak acid, but say a pH of 1 would be a very strong acid. Lots of hydrogen ions. On the other hand, a base... A weak base might have a pH of, say, 8. And a strong base might have a pH of, say, 13. So bases have a pH above 7, and the further you go above 7, the lower the hydrogen ion concentration gets, and the, it becomes more basic. Or another word for basic is alkaline. You end up with an alkaline solution, so acidic and alkaline. So that's really what they want you to know in this chapter about acids and bases, that acids increase the hydrogen ions, bases sort of decrease the hydrogen ions, that there's a scale that we use to measure how strong an acid or a base is, and that scale goes from 0 to 14, with 7, neutral, being in the middle. The stronger the acid, the, the lower the pH, the stronger the base, the higher the pH, and then 7 is neutral. Now a buffer... And all you really need to know about buffers is a definition. A buffer is something that helps to minimize the change in pH. For example, your blood pH is around 7.4. But it turns out that if you have a lot of carbon dioxide, like you're exercising and you're making a lot of CO2, that actually uh, can turn your blood a little bit acidic. But in your blood, you have these things called buffers, and they're, they're exactly like what a buffer zone is. A buffer is sort of like a protector, a cushion. So what a buffer would do is when, the, when the, um, the carbon dioxide levels start to go up and your blood may start to become acidic, uh, what would actually happen is the buffer would sort of counteract that. We're not really going to talk about how it does it, but just know the definition that a buffer, it's something that living things have in them 
that can help to stop changes in pH. Now, a buffer, just so you know, can be overcome. In other words, it's not like a, even if you had a cushion, if you had a cushion that if you drop your iPhone, it doesn't break. It's possible, though, that you could drop it from high enough that the phone still breaks because that's more than the cushion can tolerate. And the same is true with you. In normal circumstances, the pH of your blood stays very stable, even if you're exercising or you're sleeping or no matter what you do. But if something was extreme, like you held your breath for a long time or you breathe into a paper bag for a long time or something like that, or somebody hyperventilates, the pH could change because it might be too much for the buffer to take care of. The last thing they mention here is that a drop in pH is a 10 times increase in hydrogen. That's because of the way that it's calculated. So we said that as the pH goes down, the hydrogens go up. The amount they go up is 10 times for every pH number. So just to show you this uh, checkpoint question, you won't have anything this difficult on the test, but they say um, if you have a pH of 9 and you have a solution at a pH of 4, how many times more hydrogen does the pH of 4 have than 9? So you could do this. So 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So when it goes from 9 to 8, that's going to go up 10 times. From 8 to 7, 10 times more. 7 to 6, 6 to 5, 5 to 4. So how much more hydrogen? It's going to be 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. So that's actually going to be 10 to the 5th, or if you want to write that with zeros, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 100,000 times more hydrogens in a pH of 4 than a pH of 9. And these are just some examples of some common substances. So you see how pure water is a pH of 7, uh, but like ammonia that you might use for cleaning or bleach, they have pHs up in the 11, 12, so they're kind of stronger bases. Seawater is a very weak base, right, pH of about 8. Um, but rainwater is somewhat acidic, pH of 5. Notice cola, Coca-Cola, pH of 3. So it's not like if you drink something with a low pH, it's going to necessarily burn up your esophagus or whatever. Coca-Cola has a pH of 3. Uh, but it depends on other factors. But a uh, really strong pH would be like battery acid has a pH uh, 1. I've actually seen where it's some um, things say battery acid has a pH of 0. So um, neutral is 7. More hydrogens as this pH goes down towards 0, and that becomes a stronger and stronger acid. This way, it becomes increasingly basic or more alkaline, remember, is another word for that. All right, this is just a close-up of the same information. And then moving on. Um, this last section is actually not going to be on your test, but it's a little bit of a sort of a public service announcement. They're talking about carbon dioxide. Uh, the, the beginning question in the chapter was talking about how could increasing amounts of CO2 affect us? Um, it, because we were learning about the chemical nature of life. Well, fossil fuels, as you know, make a lot of CO2, and they talk about climate change. Um, we make a lot of CO2, and what happens is, believe it or not, this carbon dioxide doesn't just stay in the air, it can become absorbed, uh, dissolved, sorry, in the ocean water. And what it does when it dissolves in the ocean water is it actually makes the ocean acidic. And you might say, well, how does that happen? I, CO2 doesn't have any hydrogen in it. Well, what actually happens is, as that CO2 goes in, um, it actually causes formation of bicarbonate ions, these ions. And then what ends up happening is, uh, so how does this affect the ocean? So the ocean water becomes more acidic when the H plus uh, hooks up with these carbonate ions. But the problem is that coral reefs and other organisms that build shells, they use carbonate to build their shells. Carbonate without hydrogen on it. So the more carbon dioxide we put in the water, the more the carbonate that was there hooks up with hydrogen and forms hydrogen carbonate, and now this is not available to the coral reefs anymore. So again, you're not going to be tested on this, but it basically explains that they did an experiment to see how does the, the effect of uh, the amount of carbonate available, how does that affect the amount of um, reef building that happened, coral. And here's what they found, that the more carbonate is in the water, the more calcification or the more calcium gets built into coral. 
So you might say, oh, so that's a good thing. Right, but remember what I told you is that the more CO2 in our atmosphere, it removes the carbonate. It turns the carbonate into hydrogen carbonate. And now this is not available. So you're all the way down here. So now the corals can't build. So that's basically what your book is talking about in this experiment. Our independent variable, they ask you, was the carbonate. They added different amounts of carbonate. The dependent variable, what they measured, was how much calcification happened. In other words, how much carbonate got stuck into the coral reefs. So they changed the amount of carbonate and then measured how much calcium got put into the reefs. Just a reminder about independent and dependent variables. All right. Um, and then this last little thing here is just about emergent properties. They're talking about why we think uh, presence of water would be important for finding extraterrestrials. Well, we've talked about all the properties of water, how it moderates temperatures, how things dissolve well in it. Um, and so we're made of like 70% water. So when we look for extraterrestrial life, we always think of living things as needing water just like we do. So those emergent properties of water being cohesive and adhesive and moderating temperatures and taking sweat away from your body and having a high surface tension, all of that stuff, we think that would be necessary for things to be alive somewhere else unless extraterrestrials don't need water, which would be very, that would make them very different from us. But we usually make the assumption that they're probably like us and they would also need water. So there must be water on a planet if there's going to be life on the planet. All right, um, this is just what you're supposed to be able to do. And in class, we filled this out. So I'll go ahead and do it in the video as well. So atoms have three subatomic particles, positively charged protons. And that give the element the atomic number. Neutral neutrons and in isotopes they can have different numbers of neutrons we talked specifically about radioactive isotopes and how they could be used in things like pet scans or dating fossils stuff like that so uh neutrons isotopes are important even though they don't have different charges they can be important in science and then the electrons are the ones that are negative and they're the ones that determine what kind of bonds are going to form chemical bonds so whether it forms ionic bonds or covalent bonds. So that was our first, that's the first one. And then the second one here is about bonds. So if electrons get transferred, you end up with ions. And the attractions between ions form what are called ionic bonds. On the other hand, if electrons are shared, notice the picture here how their electrons are shared with each other, whereas here an electron is being transferred. This forms covalent bonds. And covalent bonds can either be nonpolar if they're sharing perfectly evenly, such as in the two hydrogens in this picture, they're each sharing perfectly evenly, or it can be unequal sharing, which forms what's called polar covalent bonds which is like what's in water. And water has the polar covalent bonds because oxygen has a much higher electronegativity, make sure you know this for the test, by the way, than the hydrogen does, meaning it pulls much harder on the electrons. So the oxygen ends up with, technically it's not a full charge, it's a partial charge, it's like this symbol with a minus on the oxygen, they're simplifying in your book, and a partial positive charge on the hydrogens. And that's important, because then the opposite charges attract each other and you get these really strong attractions that are not really bonds, even though they're called hydrogen bonds, but they're very strong attractions between the water and those are called hydrogen bonds. Remember, they're made and broken over and over and over again. And that's what gives water all those special properties being cohesive, adhesive, a good temperature moderator, the fact that ice floats because these bonds lock and make water less dense as a solid. So all those properties of water come from the polar covalent bonds in the water molecule here and here. Those are your polar covalent bonds. And then the hydrogen bonds that form between waters that are just strong attractions. And so that pretty much ends chapter two. Hopefully this will be useful for anyone who is absent to study for the test.